Just uh, thank you, Kevin, for the opportunity to address the committee tonight. It was great to see people last night in Mansfield. Uh, the family fun night uh, spent several hours there. So you, a nice chat with you, Kevin, other than Joe. And so it was great to be out see a good spirit amongst people and engage with people in Mansfield. Um, I've been there just, I'm running for a third term as district attorney. I've been the district attorney for the past, excuse me. I've been the district attorney for the past seven and a half years and I'm here because of the support of the people from Bristol County, such as yourself. Uh, I have strong roots in Bristol County and I, as the district attorney, I've tried to be the, uh, represent all of Bristol County. Um, during my past, uh, the past seven and a half years, I believe our office has had a number of accomplishments. Uh, we've had several high pro profile convictions, including the Aaron Hernandez case. Uh, with these celebrity cases in many jurisdictions, the cases often don't work out, but due to the work of the great work of the prosecution team, it was a successful prosecution and conviction despite the fact that it was the tragic ending. It's also the conviction of Michelle Cotter for uh, in the suicide, manslaughter suit, goading someone into committing suicide. Uh, every step of the way appeals were upheld. Again, another tragedy, but uh, this shows you the ability and the uh, uh, to, to successfully prosecute these cases. I'm very proud uh, of our over 90% homicide solve rate. Uh, that is for homicides committed in Bristol County. It's well above the national average. It's uh, special uh, efforts uh, and thanks to the uh, investigators and prosecution. We try to use the most advanced technology to solve these most serious crimes. Um, I fought hard to keep violent criminals off the street by utilizing dangerous hearings to protect the community and vulnerable victims. Uh, people have a right to feel safe in their communities. Uh, the vulnerable, I focused on protecting women, children, the elderly and the disabled and innocent people. Um, I'm particularly proud of an initi initiative I started seven and a half years ago, um, an elder fraud unit. It was clear that our uh, senior citizens who have given so much to our communities were being abused, especially financially. Uh, frankly, they deserve to be protected as much as we can. I created a unit and focused on those cases through both prosecution and prevention. I've been to every senior center in Bristol County at least once, in many cases, multiple times and other senior uh, agencies. I was just up in Mansfield recently um, for a triad meeting and it was great to engage with the seniors. I spoke to them for 10 or 15 minutes about prevention. And frankly, there was a case uh, where an individual associated with the, uh, the senior center was going to be scammed out of almost $30,000. Senior center. Tim. We talked about prevention, how important it is because you can't hear me. Oh yeah. We, we have a little bit of a bad connection. Like you're breaking up a little. You're getting something that says internet and unstable. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah, we yeah, can hear you. Can hear you. Yes. It's just you're breaking oh, up I can a little. Yeah, you. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. I just that's the only problem with this has happened to me a few times. So I just was touching on the senior center of Anfield. How when I spoke recently, it was great to engage and see some people I hadn't seen for uh, several years, but. Talking about prevention, I don't know if you heard it, there was a case somebody was almost swindled out of 30,000 that day or uh, shortly before that. And uh, I just emphasize to them that A, I care about you. I've done something about it. Uh, and you gotta be careful. You really can engage with people uh, on the phone, to provide information. So that's been a, prior, a very successful priority of mine. And I'm very uh, pleased um, that that has continued. It's been, the last two years have been, you know, sort of, uh, 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 it hasn't been the same because of COVID and uh, a lot of the centers have been shut down. So I miss that very much and have been able to re-engage with that. You know, recently being in Mansfield and other communities and I feel reinvigorated by reinvigorated if you know, but uh, we're losing you again. Yeah. Right again. 
celebration of seniors. Uh, let's go. Uh, yeah. Tommy, you're really breaking up pretty bad. He was very well received in uh, the seniors who, frankly, didn't deserve it. It was on domestic violence, protecting women in face uh, from what occurred. Tom, can you hear me? I think he's gone, guys. No. Oh, he's back. Tom, you're back? You're muted. You're muted, Tom. Can you hear me? Yep, try it can again. You, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Just uh, So I was just talking about the uh, cold case unit solving this serial rapist from uh, two, two, two in, Eastern and Canton, uh, by you utilize uh, in can, can you hear me? You're breaking up again, no. Tom. I don't know what's going on there. I'm sorry. I keep losing yeah, you. Want to try to move from? Well, maybe I'll. All right. Let me see if I can move because I was afraid of this. Um, you want to go um, to the kitchen? Well, we'll see. I'm going to try to hold it up and see if you can hear me any better. Yeah, can you, can you hear me any better? Yes, much yes, better. So far, so far, yeah. Okay, yeah, that just got okay, better. Okay, I'm going to stand up here and talk as I look out. I'm <laughs> at home, so I'm sorry that this happened the last time. So, um, okay. Want to hold it? Um, I was just talk, touching on the cold case unit and. Um, what we've done is prioritized, uh, it came to our attention in investigating the unsolved murder about over 20, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the 2000s in New Bedford, that sexual assault kits were not being fully tested by the lab. Um, victims, uh, uh, victims uh, women and victims of sexual assault go through this intrusive procedure and the, kit, the kits were not fully tested, which was unacceptable. When I found out about it, I applied for a grant through the federal government, got the funding to send these cases out to a private lab. Uh, we didn't know about it, nor did law enforcement. Although it got off to a slow start with the lab, we're in the process of testing over 1,100 cases in Bristol County. This was a statewide problem. Uh, I was you know, certainly upset about it, but have done something about it. And by the end of the year, we should have all of our cases fully tested. I'm very proud that recently two cases, these cold cases, violent sexual assaults in New Bedford were charged because of this initiative. If I hadn't pushed to have the rape kits tested, individuals would not be charged with violent rapes. One person was had sexual offenses going back uh, in New Bedford, very concerning. Another one was just arrested, be, uh, charged because it was give, they gave a DNA sample in Florida. And then when we had the kit fully tested, uh, we had the kit fully tested. Uh, it came back as a hit. So those cases are charged. The victims are very pleased and feel vindicated. Uh, so I'm just happy with that, uh, that we've uh, taken that initiative. So um, that's sort of a highlight uh, of, of, what, uh, uh, of what we've accomplished and many other things, just trying to run the office effectively, being ready for trials, protecting people during the pandemic. The, the jury trials was shut down, which really hampers you. So they've been picking up now and we've been ready to process these cases. Um, I also would like to just point out the, um, I have a balanced approach to prosecution. I believe in protecting the public from dangerous criminals, but also fair treatment of people. Uh, that's important part of our justice system. Uh, I have given, I have an, I'm very active in the community with a number of programs dealing with uh, substance abuse, with um, uh, prior to people being brought to court on lower level offenses. I've started a Bristol Alliance, which brings everybody from the county together to talk about the best practices to address the substance abuse issues in the county. Uh, we hit recently renewed our teen safety summit, bringing teens together throughout the county. In fact, someone was there, uh, a survivor of the, uh, the shooting in Florida, I believe it was the Parkland shooting, spoke very uh, movingly about what was transpiring there. This was uh, uh, last month. So it's just great to see people back together. Uh, we've engaged again, a number of, uh, we speak in the schools about prevention, domestic violence, substance abuse, the abuse of technology. So there's been a number of pro uh, programs we've done. I'm here because of the support of uh, people of Bristol County. Uh, 
I hope they'll continue to support me. I think I've done the job, tried to uh, you know, be fair and balanced in how we approach things. Uh, and I look for your, you know, hopefully have your continued support so I can continue on as district attorney. And again, I've tried to be the district attorney for all of Bristol County. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Tom from anybody? I have a question. Deb? Um, Tom, I, I should know this, but I don't. What do you think is the best way to handle um, nonviolent drug offenders? Well, it, it, Ma'am, it, it depends on the circumstance. It depends on the nature of the record. It depends if one views them as a threat to the community. If someone, someone may have a history of committing crimes, I think first and foremost, they, have to, they, the person at some point, have to come to grips with it. They, they have a problem and that they're willing to address it. We've had a, um, a drug court that's gone on, frankly, in New Bedford for 21 years. It's dealing though with a little more offenders that uh, when I, it's now referred to as a recovery court, but it's dealing with offenders who may have had a long history of drug abuse, but they have to accept the program. That has had some success, but I think it's, I think it's trying to focus on treatment. If most of these people again don't prevent a threat to the community, uh, and through treatment they can come to grips with um, their, you know, their, their problems that impact their lives. You know, some of the stories of moving of people, you know, who who are gripped with substance abuse, and when you hear them talk, when they have clear heads and they've gone through the uh, uh, programs, uh, it, it's it, it's it's very uh, heartwarming and good to hear. I, I had in a number of years ago, I remember a guy distinctly, I had to agree to allow this person to go to the drug court because it was a violent uh, offense. But a probation officer spoke to me and I agreed to it. And he went through the program and he graduated. And I remember going to court, a lot of people, and he did thank me and said, thank you for giving me a chance. And he had moved on with his life, was working. Hopefully it's, it's, it's still there. So I think it's a combination of what is their record what is the particular situation? They have to be open to treatment. There can be a pretrial diversion in some cases, which we've done both for juveniles and adults. Um, there could be probation with counseling. Um, and I think that that's the approach because ultimately, you know, most people are not a threat to public safety, especially to come into the district court. Uh, I, I am obviously focusing on the ones that are, but I think it's a combination of efforts. You've got to have the services available in the community, but the person wants to have it and there's going to be relapses. But I think trying to work with them through uh, drug treatment and programs, and then if they, if they fall, they can be, you know, reprobated uh, and try to move forward with their lives. So um, that's my general approach to it, but um, I think so, I thank you. Yep. Okay, I guess that's it. Uh, yes, Martha, uh, Jane? Jane. Did you mute it, Jane? Jane, you're muted. I'm telling her to ask her. There you go. Uh, there we go. So, uh, so Tom, I appreciated that you were talking about um, assisting senior citizens with uh, scam issues. And I was wondering whether your office would have anything to do with the zillions of telephone scams we get all the time, or if that if if that's a different office. Well, it depends what they are. I am very. I've been since I've you know we've been reengaged with the centers. It's a, a lot of this is through phone call scams, and the the, the first question is trace these people. So whoever's calling you, if they call you and, and you, you, they, you had a number through our state police division, sometimes they, they get rid of these phones that you can't trace them. Um, I think the, you could try, you know, you could, people don't have the resources to cover the volume of calls. I think if a crime has been committed, it can be reported to the police. I'm, my focus, though, is, and I say this in a loving way to everybody, you can't you can answer the phone, but to become engaged with these individuals that you do not know, somebody looking for money, nothing good is going to come of it. So you, I would say you could report it to the police. Um, you certainly could report it to our office. The general harassment of people, if they call, let's say I call you, but you hang up or you listen to me and then, you know, shut me off. Unfortunately, it's just such a terrible nuisance that it's gone on for a while. But uh, 
if you are scammed, I would call the police. You could call Brista Elder Services. I have a special unit for that. That doesn't mean we can track them down, but if it was appropriate, I would have the state police look into it. But tracing these phone numbers is almost impossible. They're local. They come up local. They come on my phone. Uh, I mean, getting these email scams, somebody sending things says, hi, how are you? Will you, you know, so we're, we're all subject to it. But I think the short answer is you can go to the police, you could call the DA's office, you call Bristol Elder Services. But the key is you don't want to get involved because it's so tough to prevent them from calling. Yeah. Um, it's very frustrating. The, the, one of the things I'm trying to preach if you, is our seniors in some cases are isolated. You may be by yourself whatever the circumstances are. Our seniors are nice people. They're raised well. They get nervous. I might get, you know, even myself, somebody, you might just want to get rid of somebody. They call up and say, it's a grandparent scam. Your grandson's in jail in, you know, uh, uh, Alaska or Washington. And I could give you a lot of examples. Like I just said about Mansfield, that that person was going to lose 30 grand that day. Somebody just told me under the grandparent scam, a woman repeatedly gave somebody $20,000 in legal fees. So what they do is they prey on your psyche, startling you, the IRS, let's say they want you, then I no the IRS doesn't call anybody over the phone. It's not the IRS, but it startles somebody. They're going to arrest you with somebody outside. So then you capitulate maybe to get them to either protect the grandson or get them off your back. But if you try to trace those numbers, we can't do it. So I think the key, uh, ma'am, is just to do not engage. You have to be brutal about it. Oh. And that's why I will go repeatedly to these senior centers because once the money's gone, it's gone. And there's, um, it's so tough to do it. So the controlling the phone calls is very difficult. If it's a crime, you can call the police. You're free to call our office and ask for financial crimes and we can look into it. Or bristle other services, but I don't know if, how they would respond to the phone calls. They might respond to abuse that's going on. So I hope that somewhat answers your question, but it, it's a terrible situation that, that, that uh, is going on here, but we all have to be disciplined. I don't answer the phone at home. Now, it, I have my cell phone. I'm not telling you not to answer the phone if the doctor's calling, but if the doctor's calling with news, they're going to leave a message, right? They leave messages, and then you call them back. Um, if you don't know anybody in Arizona or Wyoming, nothing good's come of that, or, you know, or Africa or Pakistan. I've heard and seen too many tragedies about this, and I care, you know, I'm very sad to hear that. So, I'm going on a bit because this is important and I feel strongly, but if that is of any help to you, surely if any, if there's any problem, please call my office. I, I'm over to that, but call the police. But it's very, once you're hooked on a number, if you do anything over the phone, it's going to be very tough to trace it, if not impossible. And the, and the uh -huh. federal government's overwhelmed. Everybody's overwhelmed because there's thousands of millions of these calls, these scam artists trying to manipulate people. So thank you. Thank you, Tom, for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. All right. Uh, Thank you. Angel, Have a good night. Town Committee wishes the best of luck. Please keep in touch with us, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. It was great to see you tonight and last night, Kevin. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye -bye. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, George McNeil, candidate for sheriff of Bristol County. George, uh, you're muted at this time, but we'd like to hear from you. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not now, Kevin. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I met. I'm at uh, one of my fundraisers tonight, so um, I had to come out to the car to, to call you guys, um, but that's okay, because I, you know, I knew this, this was coming up tonight, but unfortunately, the way the venues go, you have to, you have to, you know, go by what they, they want to do uh, as far as the, the nights that they have available, so we had to go by tonight, and tonight was the, the, the night they had, so we had to go by it, and I, I said, well, I'm not going to cancel the Mansfield Democratic Committee, because I wanted to talk to you guys. And I, I have met some of you before. Kevin, of course, we know each other. Um, and I have met Joe Kaplan and, and others. Um, it's a pleasure It's a pleasure to have you and to talk to you. I asked, you was asked yesterday when I showed up at the uh, fun, Family Fun Night, um, when I put my signs there, uh, one of the uh, people of the committee said, uh, they said, you're a cop and uh, you, you're here? I said, well, yeah, I'm a Democrat. And uh, <laughs> it's like, why, why is it a problem? Because <laughs> I'm a police, I've been a police officer 30, over 35 years. And, and I guess it was surprising that uh, I, I was, I was there with my signs as, as a democratic candidate, but I just, so I grew up in Randolph, Mass, um, right near Boston. And my parents were very extreme Democrats. I'll just tell you that. 
and they were very big Kennedy supporters, right from uh, John F. Kennedy right up to Ted Kennedy. Uh, I grew up in that environment, even though I became a police officer, and I was, you know, I became more middle road uh, as I grew up. But, anyways, I didn't want to get into that. I just want to tell you why we, why I'm here. So I'm running for sheriff, Bristol County. Uh, my opinion is, and and I'm gonna my colloquy right now is going to be different than what I told other caucuses in the, in the, over the past few months because I have more experience now talking to people like you. So uh, I'll just tell you this, that uh, I have the best chance of beating him, Hodgson, and he needs to go. Bad news. He's bad news for the county. He's bad news for the jails. He's bad news for the people that work there and the people that have to spend time there. Uh, he doesn't do anything for them except for now when it's re-election time because I have people that work on my campaign and that work inside the jail that are giving me all the information about what's going on there. And all he's doing is have a, he has propaganda companies coming up with crap to throw out there that he, everything's great at their Bristol County house of correction and houses of correction. And that uh, he's doing a great job, which is a bunch of BS. It's not, it's, it's bad. And the people who work there are having a bad time. The counselors, my campaign manager is an addiction counselor. I won't mention his name, but he works in, with addiction uh, people. He, he was an addict himself, and he works with the with the, the people coming out of there. And he said he's just not enough, he doesn't provide enough help. So I'll leave it at that. But let me get back to my background. So I, I've been over 35 years in police in policing in criminal justice field. Uh, I, I got into the the the, the field when I was in uh, in senior in college in 1985. Um, I became a full time police officer in Randolph in 1987, where I grew up because uh, I graduated Randolph High School. Um, I, I became, I, I was, uh, I went and moved through the ranks of the police department of Randolph, um, all the way up to Lieutenant and, and I became Lieutenant in 2003 and I maintained that rank until 2014 when I became as a police chief in Somerset. Um, I was a accreditation manager. I got the uh, department certified as a, an agency with the mass police Accredi accreditation commission, which I am still a, a member of, and I still work for them. I am actually a, pay, a paid member of the Accreditation Commission. So I facilitate accreditations for police departments throughout the state. So I very much involved with policing and make, sh make sure that, they, that we have the best police departments in the state. Uh, uh, and there's only right now only 98 of them. But so there's a lot way, a long way to go. But anyway, um, so through my career, I, I became a, a professor at Bridgewater State University in 19. 2007. I taught there for 11 years till 2018. It was in the middle of my uh, career as a police chief. Uh, it became intertwined with that, um, which became a problem. So I had to really stop teaching at that time. Uh, but I enjoyed teaching. I was a great professor. If you want to look up my ratings on ratemyprofessor.com, you can see that I was a good professor um, at Bridgewater State. Uh, the students loved me uh, right back to 07. Many of them have become police officers, attorneys, FBI agents and, and you, you name it, they've all become, and a lot of them send me messages thanking me for my, um, my, my tutelage as their professor. But anyway, so uh, through my, uh, my trials and tribulations as a police chief, um, that was the most difficult job I ever had. I was the most progressive and innovative chief in the county. Uh, I developed many programs. If you look at my past history, um, you can just Google it and see all the programs I started since I became chief. I started the first canine program there. Uh, I, I, started, I, I started a newsletter in 2015. I wrote a week, weekly newsletter for years, which I intend to do as sheriff. I will write a newsletter. It might not be every week, but it might be every month to inform the county of what I'm doing and be transparent. The biggest, the biggest issue that one of the biggest issues is that there's no transparency with the sheriff's department right now. Nobody knows what's going on there unless you hear rumors from people that you know that they're, as, as a sheriff, I'm gonna be transparent as possible. You're gonna know how much money I'm spending, what I'm spending it on, who's in my administration, why they're there, why they're qualified to be there and to be the best that they can be. Um, I have the ability to do that because I budgeted, planned, organized, and just been great at directing people and, and leading people in the right direction as to what to do. And I've done that throughout my career. And I, I know I can do this as a sheriff um, and I, and, and, and Tom Hodgson has to go. He really, he, and I need the support of you guys and the other Democrats, um, to, to back me up. And I know, you know, a lot of people are waiting until September 6th and waiting to, 
the primer to see who the good candidate is. But I'm telling you, the people need to get by behind candidates now that they trust can win. And I, I know I can win, but you got to get behind me. Uh, and I and I and I really like Nick Bernie and I really like Paul Haru. They're good people. But I think I have the best shot. That's, of course, it's not my big ego speaking. I just think that I, 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 I have a, the best shot because of my law enforcement background. And they did a, they did a survey in the, within the past year or so that said, what do you expect out of your sheriff? What would you want out of your sheriff? And, and it, the 55% uh, said they have law enforcement background. And I have that. And the other candidates don't. And if you look around the state, not a lot of sheriffs have a law enforcement background. Some are just were city councilors or state reps. There was something else. They weren't, they weren't of a law enforcement background. And I think having that in mind, that I, I know the culture of policing and I know the culture of corrections offices because I've worked in it for so long. I know what they think. I, I, I've, I've booked thousands of prisoners I shouldn't say prisons because I'm, I'm a accreditation guy, detainees over my career. I've, I've booked many people, violent, nonviolent, um, drug addicts. I've, I've, I've been involved with all of it through my career as a police officer and, and you know, bring him to the houses of correction. I, I've been in the middle of all of that as part of my career, but I'm also educated and I understand how things work and um, how the system works. And I think Looking at what Hodgson's created there, you know, it, he's created a really crappy system. I mean, I'm trying to not use expletives here, but he's he's created a really bad environment for everybody to work in. It's unsafe. Um, he pretends it's fine, but he only pretends it's fine because it's election season. Because if you asked a year or two ago, you wouldn't hear from him because he didn't care. Uh, he cares now because he's afraid. He's afraid of me. He's afraid of competition. He doesn't want to get lose his job, even though he's almost 70 years old. He doesn't want to lose his job because he has a good job and he thinks he's a popular guy. He's not popular with uh, he's he thinks he's famous, but he's not. He's infamous. He's not a good guy. And um, and I mean that wholeheartedly I, as as a person, county police chief association president for three and a half years. And even when I left, I was still president of the association. We tried to have him in numerous times to talk to us. He came in once, probably about almost two years ago now, to talk to us during the pandemic. He put his mask on. And I tell you right now, we had about 14 chiefs out of 20 in the county there. And I guarantee you five of them were just hammering him with questions. And he had no answers. He just blamed it on the pandemic. And the, the, the chiefs didn't like him. They just like, this guy is not one of us. And I'll just tell you this. If you're a, a sheriff, you're the, you're the chief law enforcement officer of the county, you need to have a relationship with all your police chiefs to, so you can network with them so that you can do the right thing in every city and town that you're there and you can implement things in every city and town and have a good relationship with them. He had none of that with Bristol County, none of it. Other than this triad program, he had no relationship with any of us. He didn't reach out to us, he never talked to us unless we had to ask him a question. He wouldn't even answer his phone. It was, it was just a terrible relationship. The, the guy's arrogant. He's narcissistic. He needs to go. So I, I, I know a Democrat needs to beat him, and I'm the one that, I'm the one that can do it. And that, that's my spiel, guys. <laughs> I hope you um, – if you have a question, I, uh, Gene, if you do, uh, I have no problem. I'll answer whatever you want. Yeah, um, I want to know – I mean, I, I hear that you don't like him. Um, neither, neither do I, by the way. Um, but – what in particular do you not like about how he has handled um, the prison and his job? And what would you do differently if you were the sheriff? Well, he, he, during his tenure, he's never done enough for rehabilitation, um, addiction counseling, mental wellness. He's never done any of that. He's never done anything to promote vocational training. Um, and, and, and there are other, uh, there, there's many other things he hasn't done until uh, now it's election season. Now he's done. I, I see that he's, uh, some people at work there said, oh, he's implemented a program, which he never did before, but he's doing it because he's must be reelected, but through his tenure, he's never done anything. If you look at his website, his website shows the backside of inmates 
or I call them detainees, not inmates, walking in a chow line, he goes, there's no free passes here. Imagine that on your website and you're running for sheriff re to be reelected. That's what you have on your website in 2021, uh, 2022. Are you kidding me? That that's and, and, and his other his other picture is he's tough on crime. How are you tough on crime? You're not a law enforcement officer. You're a jailer. You're supposed to be taking care of the custody of people that are in your care. Not you're not punishing people. He thinks he's supposed to punish people. I don't want to do that. I want to rehabilitate people. I want to give them a chance. I want to give them counseling as much as it can be. And, and believe me, I appreciate the fact that there are career criminals, but you're in a house of correction here. You're not dealing with murderers and rapists. You're dealing, because those are in state prison. That which we're dealing with people that are either waiting trial, which could be a murderer, don't get me wrong, but most people are in there because they have a suspended license. They, they have a third drunk driving. Um, it, it could be a burglary, it could be, but they're not in there because they're, they've committed heinous crimes. But he wants to pretend that he's a prison warden. He's not. He's a sheriff of a jail. It's not a prison. It's a jail. There's a big difference between jail and prison. So I taught this in, in, in uh, Bridgewater State. There's a huge difference. People, they, they interchange the two terms. They're, they're not, the jail and prisons are two different things. Jails are temporary holding facilities. Prisons are long term. So people that are there are not long term. Like he wanted to pilt send his people down to build a wall. These people are there for six months, eight months, nine months, 10 months. If you get somebody that's here in a, there in a year and a half, then that, they probably committed a felony, but they reduced it to a, a lower crime. Uh, I'm just telling you, because I prosecuted in the system before as a cop. And I, I'm just telling you that the people are not there for long periods of time. So and, and they're in there because they have drug problems. They have, uh, they're, addic they're addicted to something, they have mental health problems, or they, they, they can't read and write. And it, th these things all have to be addressed. So I want to address these things by giving them vocational programs so they can learn a trade, they can learn how to drive a truck, they can learn how to uh, build a building, they can learn how to do all these things while they're there instead of sitting in a cell looking at, at a, uh, 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 you know, a, um, a tablet and playing games on it. And, but we need some people to teach them how to read books, teach them how to write, and teach them all these things. And we can, that can be done because he's, he's, I'll tell you, he's pissing away more money into crap that they don't need. Like, you know, mobile command vehicles and all this other crap. Why do they need that? They don't use them. Put that money into vocational training. Put that money to other things. So that's what I would do if I was a sheriff. I would totally... I'm, I'm good at moving money around to be in the right. I did it as a police chief. I put this, the money in the right place and put the right people in the right positions. I would get rid of people that are useless and, and, I, and they're just getting paid a salary because he's friends with them. And he does that a lot. And I'm, I'm not, and I'm not talking out of school here. I know for a fact there's people that work there that are getting paychecks in six figures and they don't do anything. And that's going to stop if I'm there. I'm telling you, that's going to stop. That's going to be total revamping of the whole system. I will Thank you. Streamline that department, and you, Jack, you have a question? Yeah, I do. I do actually, um, George. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, Thanks, I, have, I have a concern. Um, the The purpose of the Democratic Town Committee is to elect Democrats, and I've been mm -hmm. following you on social media since the day you announced. And at the beginning of your announcement, you mentioned that you really didn't want to say whether you were a Dem or a Republican because you didn't want to put politics into it. And then I noticed on your billboards, um, you are not indicating any party affiliation. And I'm wondering um, why, why you did that. Actually, I, the billboards were done by um, my campaign manager who um, worked for Mayor Coogan, who just was with for a couple hours ago at my fundraiser. He, he showed up in here in Fall River and um, he worked with Tom Hoy and some other state reps that were all Democrats. And, I didn't do the billboards he did, and that was his de decision. I didn't even notice that the D wasn't there. Um, I have no problem with that, believe me. And believe me, as a police officer, there's plenty of cops that I, because, you know, because a lot of police officers are Republican, um, but there's also a lot of the unenrolled, and, and I, I find the majority of them unenrolled, which is great. Um, but there are a lot that have, uh, lean, lean to the right. And I, and as I said, 
I grew up in a, a Democratic household where my parents supported the Kennedys and anybody else in the area that was a Democrat. They didn't care who it was. And I would sit to my mother, I said, hey, mom, if Adolf Hitler had a D next to his name, would you vote for him? Well, what do you mean by that? I go, oh, you just vote for anybody that has a D. You know, I was, you know, I was just joking with her. But um, it, 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 I didn't, I, I think initially when I said that, I didn't want to make this about um, people going, and, and as you know, Jack, Jackie, as you know, people go, well, you were Democrat or Republican. And I go, well, I'm a Democrat. Well, you're Joe Biden then. I go, oh, what are you talking about? I said, I have my own policies and my own beliefs. I said, I'm not ba basing on the president of the United States. I'm basing on my own beliefs. And these are my beliefs. The Democratic beliefs it might not be the same as the president's. So I, I think affiliating with yourself with a, a certain party tends to alienate people. Um, and I have no problem saying I'm a Democrat. So I, I am. I mean, obviously I am. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Maybe, well, maybe. Thank First you. First of all, I, I understand the mistake on the billboard, but, but I also am concerned that you, that you didn't pr proofread it. Um, you know, if you're running as a Dem, I, I need to know you're running as a Dem. And okay, next if question, you, please. If, if yes, the question is, is if you continue to do this, um, are you going to be meeting with the Republican town committees? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> no. Good answer. Thank you. I, I, and, I, and I know, and I know the ones, I know the people that are in the Republican town committees and they're friggin' nuts. And I want nothing to do with them. I, 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 and I swear to God, I want nothing to do. These people are crazy. The Somerset Republican community are, are nuts. I, I want to do with them. I, I, I mean, Jim Pimentel is a good friend of mine. I don't, and I, I love talking to Jim, but I, the Republicans are like off the roll. You know, I, I looked at some of the stuff that you go back and forth with this over the over the over a period of time, and you go, yeah, they get good points. Yeah, they get good points, and then they just go radical and like, what what are they talking about? And I'm like, I can't even deal with these people. So no, uh, you're never going to see a Republican town committee that I'm going to go to. I swear to you, I'm, you're not going to see that. <laughs> hey, we have another question, Ka Caroline. Yeah, it's it's hey, actually Caroline. Jack. No, it's actually Jack. We we share. Okay. Hey, George. Hi, Jack. You don't look like Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> She's much cuter than I am. Uh, George, I like your passion, enthusiasm, and I, and I really hope you're right when you say you you have the best chance to to win the primary. But God forbid you don't win. Will you join your fellow uh, competitors and, you know, work to get Hudson out? Yeah, I mean, that, that question has been asked before. Absolutely, I will. Yeah, uh, I, I I absolutely will. Um, it, uh, no, no matter what I think their chances are, I, I will still help them. Um, I, and honestly, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I've been kind of these prognosticators over the years that thought that uh, I was the uh, I was always good at predicting predicting election elections, and um, and, and um, I, I just thought that that um, I, I am I was not the right you know I was I was right about election stuff, and I'm not saying that I'm, I'm like a guru of, of it, but you know I, I just see what's going on now, and, and and pretty much I was I predict things right. I'm not saying predict things right here, but I just feel that. Um, I look at the other candidates involved here, and I, I don't. I, I know Paul does a good job, um, door to door and grassroots, uh, and I and I and I know and I know Nick does the same. But I didn't look at qualifications. If if it came down to, if the people were trying to go in November, they went to the election ballot and they, and they said, they said they see. George McNeil from 99 Lynch Ave in Somerset, re, 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 um, retired police chief or a former police chief, um, and, they, and, they, and then they see uh, Hodgson, and and I did the right the right the right thing of campaigning. They'd say, "Well, we want a, a former police chief in there. We got to get rid of this guy." And I think if you saw the mayor of Fall River um, of Attleboro in there. And so a form of, you know, next form of process, I'm, I'm, you know, you know, I'm doing, a pro I'm, I'm, I'm progressing ahead. I'm trying to think of what these, what things are going to come up. And I think those things are going to come up. And I'm thinking about people in the ballot box when they are making a decision, if they knew nothing about us, right? They didn't know who I was. 
Paul Haru was, they knew Nick Bernie was, they knew who Hudson was, but they didn't want Hudson anymore. If they were to look at the belt and they said, former police chief of Somerset, and they, they, they go, oh, we want to get rid of, oh yeah, he's a, he, he used to be a chief, yeah, we'll vote for him. You understand what I'm saying? That That's the way I look at it. Am I wrong? Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm progressing too much ahead of it, but I'm trying to think of the, if I was a voter, what, what would I vote for if I knew nothing about anybody at all, anybody else? Because a lot of people go in the voting poll, they don't know who, who's, who's the sheriff or whatever. Oh, oh, this guy was a chief? Okay. You, you, you see what I'm saying? I, I, I don't know. Anybody, anybody on my side with this one? Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions, everybody. George, we wish you the best of luck. We hope to hear from you again soon. Thank you for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Kevin. It was great seeing you last night, and I hope Thank you, you have a great time. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Bye-bye.